Okay? Um, Bottom of page 13, from the rise and fall of nations as made plain in the book of Daniel and Revelation, we need to learn how worthless is outward and worldly glory. Daniel and Revelation is the story of the rise and fall of nations. It is not the story of the rise and fall of churches. Okay, the last six verses of Daniel 11 is talking about the papacy conquering the Soviet Union, then conquering the United States, then conquering all the countries of the world. The rise and fall of nations as made plain in the book of Daniel. You will see another quote of similar nature in the next page. A long one. I'm going to pass over. Upward look, page 96, and then a one-liner from Bible Training School, December 1st, 1912. The prophet Daniel described the kingdoms that would rise and fall. Daniel 11, verse 41, the glorious land, it's a kingdom that falls. It's not a church. You follow me? Argument number eight, from the beginning of Daniel's last prophecy, you have the verses there, 11 verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9. If you're not familiar what those verses represent, break open God's helping hand. Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. And you'll see that the whole prophetic history of Daniel 11 is talking about the conquering of nations, period. For us to believe that all through these verses we're seeing nations conquered by other nations all the way up to verse 41 and then you get to verse 41 and suddenly it's not the conquering of a nation, it's a conquering of a church. It, it's just inconsistent with how the Lord speaks to us. He would have to take some verses in advance of verse 41 and teach us somehow, hey, I'm going to change gears here now. This whole vision is about nations that have been conquered, but now I'm going to switch and identify the Seventh-day Adventist church being conquered. It's out of the context of the vision itself, Daniel 11 visions. Ninth argument, three Romes. Very quickly, when pagan Rome took control of the world, according to Daniel 8, 9, had to conquer three geographical areas. What are those three geographical areas? Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Israel, Palestine. When did it conquer the third of those three geographical areas? Conquered Egypt, the third, 31 BC, the Battle of Actium, one of the most famous maritime battles in ancient history. And then it ruled the world supremely for a time in fulfillment of Daniel 11:24 for 360 years until Constantine moved the capital of the empire to Constantinople. But before it could rule the world supremely, it had to conquer three geographical areas, Syria, Israel, Egypt, then it ruled for 360 years. Rome is a triple application of prophecy. Pagan Rome, Papal Rome, identify the characteristics of modern Rome. In order for Papal Rome to take control of the world, in Daniel chapter 7, three horns had to be plucked up. The Heruli, the Ostrogoth, the Vandals. What was the third that was plucked up? The Ostrogoths. When were they plucked up? 538, once the third geographical area was overcome, Papal Rome ruled the world supremely for 1260 years. That's the same as Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome has to conquer three geographical areas and it rules the world supremely for 360 years. Papal Rome has to conquer three geographical areas and it rules the world supremely for 1260 years. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Modern Rome, in the last six verses of Daniel 11, have to conquer the king of the south, verse 40, the glorious land, verse 41, and Egypt, verse 42. You tell me what the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt are. They have to be geographical areas. It's already been established with pagan Rome and papal Rome. The Soviet Union, the United States, or the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No, no, couldn't possibly be that. On the testimony of two, a thing is established. The Soviet Union, 1989. The United States in the very near future. Then Egypt, representing all the countries of the world. They get brought together through the activity of Islam. <laughs> right? It's the East wind that brings the one world government, right? We know that. We know that because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. It's the East wind that brings the one world government, right? Because Egypt symbolizes the world. When the, when the king of the north conquers Egypt in verse 42, he conquers the whole world. How's the whole world brought together? 
according to Seventh-day Adventists, when it's brought together, it's the threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. How does that happen? Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. How did Egypt bring the whole world together in the beginning of Egypt? Oh, it was in the time of Joseph, wasn't it? And, and Pharaoh had a dream, didn't he? And there was seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph was given the wisdom to bring all of Egypt into bondage to Pharaoh. What was it that brought the seven years of famine? Ah, oh, it was the east wind. Who's the east wind of Bible prophecy? Who's the children of the east? Ah, oh, it's Islam, brothers and sisters. It's Islam that brings the threefold union together. That's not what we're dealing with here. Tenth argument, Daniel and the Revelation. Sister White teaches more than once. You can see a few quotes here. Daniel and Revelation are the same book. If Daniel 11 verse 41 isn't the United States, where do you see the United States in the book of Daniel? Because Daniel and Revelation are the same book. Doesn't the book of Revelation talk about the United States? So where is the United States in the book of Daniel if verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church? It's not there. But Sister White says repeatedly, they're the same book. They, have, they are dealing with the same subjects. She said they complement one another, which means to bring to perfection. Okay, the divine pattern. I'll pass over the divine pattern very quickly. But Daniel 1140 begins in 1798. It tells how the deadly wound is healed by the time the papacy conquers the king of the north, by the time the king of the north conquers Egypt, it's fully returned to its former position of power. That's in verse 43. And then in verse 44, you have the tidings out of the east and the north. That's the message of the hour. And then you have the close of probation when Michael stands up and the plagues and the second coming. This is the identical sequence in Revelation 13. Sister White says, at the time when the papacy was robbed of its strength, when was the papacy robbed of its strength? 1798, John beholds a new power coming up out of the earth. Sister White, that's word for word. This is in Signs of the Times. Don't remember the date. The time the papacy was robbed of its strength, John beheld a new power coming up from the earth. So in 1798, John is seeing the vision of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 begins in 1798. It does just what Daniel 11, 40 to 45 does. It tells how the deadly wound is healed. That's what Revelation 13 is all about. And just like... Daniel eleven forty 40 to 43, once the deadly wound is identified and is being healed, you have the message of the hour. That's Revelation 14. Then you have the plagues. Revelation 14, seven, second coming of Christ. Same order. Revelation 17, John is carried to the wilderness. In verse 3, the wilderness is 1798, because when he's carried to the wilderness, which in Revelation 12, verse 6 and 14 is the 1260 years of papal rule, where when he's carried to the wilderness, he sees the woman that's already drunken with the blood of the saints. He just isn't carried to the 1260 years of papal persecution. He's carried to the end of it because she's already drunk with the blood of persecution. The persecution's already taken place. Revelation 17 starts in 1798, and it tells the story of the healing of the deadly wound. And once the story is told in Revelation 17, you come to Revelation 18, which is the message of the hour. And then you see the close of probation, second coming of Christ. Revelation 13 and 17 is the identical structure as the last six verses of Daniel 11, except for one caveat. It's the same history, identical history. It begins at the same point, ends at the same points. So all the prophets agree with one another. But the subject of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the king of the north, the beast, the papacy. The subject of Revelation 13 is not the papacy, it's the false prophet, it's the United States. The place is the papacy on the throne of the earth. And the subject of Revelation 17 is not so much the papacy, not so much the false prophet, it's the ten kings, the dragon. Okay? When you bring these three passages together, you've got the same identical history, but they're telling the story of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And the structure is perfect. And if you identify Daniel 11, verse 41, as the Seventh-day Adventist church, you destroy that structure. It becomes foolishness, crumbles to the ground. One, uh, almost done. I know I'm over time, huh? Okay, divine sequence. The glorious land in Egypt. Daniel 11, 41 to 43. First the United States, then the other countries of the world. Okay. Revelation 13, 11, the United States speaks as a dragon. When does the United States speak as a dragon? 
at the Sunday Law. At the Sunday Law, what has been fully formed in the United States? The image of the beast. Is there a difference between the image of the beast and the mark of the beast? Oh, yes. The image of the beast is the combination of church and state takes place before the Sunday law. Sister White says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must pass before they are sealed. The image of the beast is not only formed before probation closes, it's the great test of the people of God that they must pass before their probation closes, before they're sealed. And it's the combination of church and state that takes place in the United States and ultimately leads to the Sunday law in Revelation 13, 11, when the United States speaks as a dragon. Then the United States, by verse 14, goes to the whole world and says, you must set up an image of the beast. What's the definition of the image of the beast? The combination of church and state. The United States is going to force the world to accept the combination of the United Nations and the papacy, the image of the beast, at the end of the world, in order to deal with radical Islam. There's two images of the beast in Revelation 13. But Revelation 13, it's first the United States that falls, then the rest of the world. In Daniel 11, it's first the United States that falls in verse 41, and then in verse 42, the rest of the world. And in Revelation 17, it's the same sequence. And in the spirit of prophecy, she says, as America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. First, the United States than the rest of the world. If it's not the United States, if it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the sequence isn't there. It falls apart. Do you see the point? Do you, see, do you really see the point? Okay, now, do you, do you see this point? This is the point no one likes. So, well, some people like, I suppose, but a lot of people don't like. A lot of people stumble over this point. The daily. Brothers and sisters, we don't want to deal with the spirit of prophecy, okay? You can prove the daily is paganism from the Hebrew in the book of Daniel. No sweat. Don't let the theologians teach you that you can't. You can take it at the, the Hebrew level and prove that the daily is paganism. No problem. But why should we have to do that? We're Seventh-day Adventists. Sister White says those that gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily. Early writings, page 74. Go back and see what their view was. It was that the daily was paganism. And then when speaking to Daniels and Prescott in the 1910 time period, Sister White said their view of the daily, which was it was Christ's sanctuary ministry, she says that view came from angels that were expelled from heaven. Her words, not mine. His spirit of prophecy keeps it real simple. The daily is paganism. It's a satanic power. It's the power that places the papacy on the throne of the earth. Christ's sanctuary ministry, it's a godly power. Okay, this argument in the early part of the 20th century in Adventism, it was a big argument. Don't let the people tell you otherwise. When they say, Sister White says, we're not supposed to talk about the daily, they're misrepresenting her words. Okay, that wasn't, that wasn't the environment there. That's not what she was saying. But notice that the daily was either a satanic power or a godly power. This is not a minor disagreement. If you uphold the pioneer position of the daily, it's not only a satanic power, it's the power that places the papacy on the throne of the earth. Okay, that's the alpha of prophetic error. This is where the lights go off on Adventism in terms of prophecy. 